Love has walked through this door. Love is sitting across from me, not directly, but over there. And I will introduce Love to you in a minute. Right now, you are listening to or watching the Yet Come On show. Can I get a Yet Come On, Brett Barnett? Yeah, come on. That sounded stupid. <laughs> The Yet Come On Show brought to you by Oxygen Financial with two locations in the Atlanta metro. We're talking Buckhead and we're talking right here where we are in lovely Alpharetta. Ted Jenkins, go to OxygenFinancial.net for all your money needs. And you know what? Everybody needs money and everybody needs to manage your money, so let Ted manage your money. Just made that up. That's a brand new tagline. (laughs) Uh, Right now I go to Brett Barney because something we're doing right here on the Yet Come On Show is we're obviously trying to build our audience. We ask that you subscribe. Subscribe. That is free, by the way. One day it may cost you. That's right. It could. Ooh. Not well, not you watching, not you that's subscribing, but somebody that subscribes what in about two months. I may charge your ass. Yeah, Listen, why not? This show kicks ass. You gotta be an early adopter to get it free. You, Someone's gotta pay for those lap dances. Damn right. I got issues and they gotta be paid for. So what we want to do right now in the Yet Come On show is we want to give you feedback. Those of you that are sending us messages, doing the downloads and subscribing and passing this show on to all your friends. So when you're stuck in Atlanta traffic, you can <laughs> listen to us. What do you got, Brett? <laughs> all right, here's some of the comments. And first off, I'd like to say I'm glad to see that you're still alive. Oh, I am. I uh I did not go to the DR, I went to the M. Mexico. <laughs> I've never heard it referred to as the M. It's the M. I went to Mexico. I went to Mexico. I did not go to the Dominican Republic. I went to Mexico with my family because it was safer. But I will tell you, I stayed at the Hard Rock. We all know a lot of Americans, proud Americans, dying uh, at the Hard Rock. And what they've done is they've removed the, uh, be- what do you call it, the uh, room Bed liquor? and breakfast. The be- No, not the bed and breakfast, the liquor in the room. So all the fun. All the fun is out of the room. Uh, they took it out of the rooms in Mexico, and they took it out of the rooms in the Dominican Republic, and I took my son there and my wife, and I went with my father-in-law and my mother-in-law and a sister-in-law, and the only person that got the poo-poos was my wife. She <laughs> she got sick on day four and had like this like thing going on in the upper stomach area, like little pain. She had the diarrhea. She went back to the room. Good thing her and your son were the same size diaper. I'm telling you, it worked. My stomach almost fell right out of my ass. <laughs> you know what? When that falls out, it hurts. So Mexico only got one of us, but nobody died. So here I am. <laughs> That's good. All right. As glad Steve, to have you back. <laughs> it's a damn pleasure. As Steve was saying, you should definitely subscribe, rate, and review. Leave comments because I'm going to read them at the beginning of every episode. Steve has not read any of these comments, so you're going to get his reaction live on the show. I do right. well with this, Brett. If somebody wants to hate, bring it. Here we go. John Newby said, I believe Southside is a love child of the Kimmer. Hmm. So the Kimmer had Any sex truth? with somebody. Your and mom? I, my mom. And so he did my mom. Yeah. He would have had to because that's the only place I came from. Or your your grandma and then your dad was, no, because that wouldn't make you the grandma. love child. <laughs> Look, shut up. You know, I'm, I'm trying to work down the family tree of how to get Kimmer in here. All right. There's a chance that Kimmer <laughs> could be my father. The good news is my mother is still alive. My father is not. Uh, and I will question my mother under a hot light. <laughs> All right, Print on Plus wrote, Southside Steve has a little Ted Nugent in him. It's <laughs> cat scratch fever. <laughs> yeah! Really? The nude. The I nude, man. Yeah. I don't know about that. <laughs> cool Breeze wrote, love the show, but why does Brett Barney look like a 10-year-old that just got molested every time he drinks? Is that true? <laughs> I didn't know. I would say you have a young... Look, I think you have a young boy look. You have a roundish face. You're kind of like oh, a young boy look. You're, Thank you're, you. you're actually like a Charlie Brown with hair, and uh, I don't round head. Yeah, you're, little, you're cutie pie pie. And I and I will tell you if there's anybody on this program that has been with a man or I ch- what? I'm just saying if somebody had. Well, that took a left turn. Hey, against your will. That means it's not your fault. Oh, gay for the stay. I got you. Got gotcha. you. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead and be you. But go ahead. All right. My boy Ski Boy wrote in, dude. You two are the same person 25 years apart. Uh, that's a compliment. That's, I, I, I know, guess that's dude. a compliment. I think that It'd scares be, Brett. <laughs> it's better for me, not for him. You're me 25 <laughs> years ago. And finally, Ron Foster wrote in, That was awesome. I love the Kimmer and Pete. Steve didn't seem like a dumbass as he usually does. He was fun, Ouch. and the back and forth was very entertaining. I don't usually watch these kinds of things. No shot at Southside. That was definitely a shot. That was a shot. I take my, What was his name? <laughs> it was uh, Ron Foster. Ron? 
This is Southside talking to you. Actually, this is Steve Rickman. Okay, on the radio, I might play a little bit of a role. I might see Dumber just to be entertaining. But on this particular it's show, not occasionally I like to – I'm really addressing this dude right now. It's between him and the – Can you let me just talk to this guy? But you know what? On this show, if I decide to show you my intelligence, I will. <laughs> I'm still waiting. Stop. All right, now – Thank you for those reviews. Keep sending them in. Make sure you download and subscribe. Tell your friends before I start charging people. Um, right now, our talented and off-air producer, I go to one Tyler Maynard. Can you cue the music? Because it is time to meet the Yet yeah, Come On Show's guest of the week. At the age of 16, he became a firefighter. When he turned 18, he graduated high school, like most people. And he went right into the police academy. Then he spent 26 years with the Washington, D.C. Metropolitan Police Department, retiring as a detective. He worked for the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force. During his time on the FBI Evidence Response and Rapid Deployment Team, he investigated the Kobar Tower bombing in Saudi Arabia, the U.S. Embassy bombing in Kenya, and the crash of TWA Flight 800. He trained at Blackwater. His life has been played out on the big screen by Jamie Foxx in The Kingdom. He consulted on The Insider with Russell Crowe and Al Pacino. From there, he became the head of the international security for Delta. They're ready when you are. Then, he became a TV star on CNN, HLN, and Court TV. He's the only man to ever fill Nancy Grace's high heels. And those are big feet, and he's got big feet too. <laughs> Standing at six foot seven, he should be played or should be playing on the NBA. But we all know white man can't jump, nor can he. He's a proud American. He's the host with the most. Mike Brooks' radio show is in the studio. <laughs> Mike Brooks, my man. Good to be with you guys. Thanks for inviting me. Good God. I, I miss being in front of a microphone. This is fantastic. <laughs> you do well, sir. You Thank do you. well. Thank you. On occasion. On occasion. I guess uh, next week somebody will say that you had sex with my mother and I'm your son. Well, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I've been meaning to tell you, Steve. <laughs> I don't even know the age group, but I will tell you, at 6'7", I don't think my mother would ever walk the same well, way. Well, think, think about this, though. What did he name his first son? What was that? What did you name your first son? My first son is and only my first, son. Uh, it's my only son so far. Brooks. And what is my last name? Brooks. Need I say more? Coincidence? Yeah. <laughs> Check, I, please. I think. <laughs> I I think not. And I will tell and you. And I love me some Amanda. Yeah, I know you do. I know you do. <laughs> I don't know why when, when it came time to name, she goes, "I really like Brooks." Can we call him Brooks? She has cute feet too. So yeah, and I, yeah, and you do have cute feet. <laughs> Huge feet, but cute feet. But matter of fact, your feet look better than Nancy Grace's. I'm going to go ahead and tell you that. I look better in heels than Nancy Grace does, too. Yes, you do. And I just want to tell you what a pleasure it is to have you on the Yet Come On show. I know Brett Barney and I both talked. We figured this week, July 4th week, I wanted, honest to God, a proud American. I wanted a dude in here that pretty much thinks the way I do, the old America. I call it the John Wayne America. There you go. And I think we get that with you because people don't understand you got to be strong to be safe, and being a pansy is only going to get people hurt, and you're no pansy, sir. No, thank you very much. In fact, you know, with uh, the 4th of July this week, 23 years ago today, I was actually at the bombing scene in Cobar Towers. Working the bombing scene. In fact, we worked through the 4th of July. And then uh, on the 5th, they told everybody we we're going to give you the day off. And the CIA went over to Bahrain. And they loaded up a truck with booze and beer. And they brought it over to a secret location because, you know, you're not supposed to drink. No, sir. In, in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And um, I just stood at the end of the bar. I said, I want one beer. I said, and when I put my finger up, put another beer down and another beer until I pass out. And uh, because we had had nothing to drink from the time we got there on November, I mean, on June uh, 26th up until the 5th. We did. We had no beer, and for me, that's unusual. And, yeah, you uh, need your beer, bro. Absolutely, keep me keep me hydrated. Look, maybe you don't realize <laughs> I'm doing some investigating, and I do better investigating uh, when I'm buzzed. Speaking of go. drinking, I just want to say special thanks to Woodruff Reserve. I don't know that you'll always be my liquor. Who's I'm, Woodruff? Well, Woodruff, Woody, Woodford. 
Oh, did Woodruff? I say Woodruff? Woodruff? Yeah, Woodruff. <laughs> you know what? Woodruff is a Boy Scout camp I went to as a kid. That he just flashed back. can't read good. And there's a lot of Woodruffs around the uh, city of Atlanta as well. Dyslexia Maybe, getting you again. Actually, I know some of the Woodruffs. are right. Anybody know anybody that uh, is a part of the Coca-Cola family? Hello. All right, it's Woodford. That shows that maybe <laughs> I've had too damn many. I'm, Woodford Reserve is the reason you're not... Sponsoring the show because I call you Woodruff. I think that was the first time only. Southside just came here to party. Yeah, come I on. did. All right, but look, I want to talk about what you guys are drinking. Brett Barney, you did something very sweet for our guest, and I want to give you credit. what a guy. Talk, talk about it, Brett. What, what did guy. you do? <laughs> so Brooks and I, obviously, we work together at one hundred six seven. We've been working together for like three something years. Yeah, known each other. Yep, it's been a while. And he, we, I know he's a Moscow Mule guy. I'm a big Moscow Mule guy. And he'd been telling me about these things called the copper can, but they're about impossible to find. And I went and spent my weekend trying to find these things, knowing that he was coming on so we could finally enjoy them together. No, that's some brotherly Aww. love. That, I'm that, telling you. <laughs> where, I, I am touched. Where, sure, I am where, touched. What do you got there? Let me see this thing. A little Moscow mule. It's called the copper the cop, can. The copper can. It's and tasty. It's, uh, yeah, it's it, tasty. it is. I tell you, I had a Moscow mule last night at my spot, the U-joint down in, down in uh, Oakhurst. And I'm telling you what. They damn. are pretty damn good. Boy, that's good. It's I, it really is. Yeah, dude, that is like awesome for mm. a canned, pre-mixed, you know, thing. It's dude. Tasty. I might. Yeah. No, it is really good. I might buy one of those off of you to give my wife. Get her, get her going today. <laughs> is you feeling better since uh, you tried to poison her down in uh, Riviera Maya, or wherever you were down there? See, that's the thing. You go to the Dominican Republic or Riviera Maya, where I went, and your wife gets sick and dies. It's not your fault. It's theirs. Mm-hmm. But I would never do that. Mm-hmm. I love you dearly. And where have uh, a lot of the incidents in the uh, Dominican Republic, where have they, have they happened and where did you stay? Uh, that would be the Hard Rock. There you go. I stayed at the Hard Rock. You know why? I literally called the Hard Rock in the DR and I'm like, look, man, I'm abandoning and ship. I'm sorry. I'm a proud American and I'm in the press. And if you hurt me or somebody in my family, if I even get a touch of diarrhea, I'm going to talk bad about the DR for the rest <laughs> of my life. So they're like, how can we help you, sir, and get you out of here? And I'm like... But they told me I was going to get nailed with fees. But they said, hey, if you go ahead and go to the Hard Rock somewhere else, we won't hit you. So I chose Hard Rock Mexico. So. Well, you know it's bad when Delta Airlines waives change fees and allows you to cancel a flight that you already had with them to the Dominican Republic. You know things are getting bad there. They are. They are. And right now the United States has it as a level two, and I think Delta's still treating it as a level two. If it goes to a level, a level three, then it's really – Really bad, but level level two. I think we discussed uh, last week. That's the norm, right, Brett? That's just proceed with caution. I can't remember last week. <laughs> he goes week to week. He goes. <laughs> I can't remember yesterday. I just want to hold on. Let me. I That's gotta, normal. Let me address the audience again. You know, I got Brett here, and I'm just trying to include him. So I throw him an easy beach ball, and what does he do? Wait, hang on, Fancy. Steve. Let me answer this one for you. Go ahead. Yep. Or excuse me. Yeah, come on. Oh, see, now that's it. You know, there's different yeah, come ons. Mike Brooks knows there's the redneck, yeah, come on. Mm-hmm. And, and then there's like the cool, I'm getting laid in Buckhead, like Mike Brooks. It's yeah, come on. <laughs> or, or you can do the quickie, yeah, come on. I mean, there's different yeah, come ons. They're not all redneck. This shows you went down. But you are. You're white. You're, you're redneck white trash. Well, do you, I've I mean, known you for how many years? <laughs> come a on, a man. lot of years. Okay. Here's the deal I grew up, I grew up. <laughs> My formative years. I didn't. Uh, I didn't put you into poor white trash. I know, it's white trash. Just white trash. Okay. You're, you're right. From kindergarten, <laughs> Classy white trash. From kindergarten, to elementary school to high school. Yes, we had an above ground pool in a split level in College Park. Guilty. Guilty. There's no way with hair like yours that Brooksy banged your mom. So I think we're good this week. Hold on, did you fact, have skirting on your on back. your trailer? Hold on, I got it styled right now too. Check it out. Hello, That's that? really working Ooh. for people who listen to the audio. Yeah, how's that spray? Yeah, yeah. How's that spray tan working there for you too? There, uh, now, Sally. Press, press the ponytail against the microphone. <laughs> Let people get a good listen. Here, here. Put some sun there. in. He put yeah. some sun in in the ponytail. Mike Brooks. There's a man to pull your hair when. Never mind. <laughs> oh yeah, we both who hair. I'm just. I've always wondered. We both pull each other's hair. It's like ow, 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 ow. Mm. Um, no, uh, I'm glad that you do follow me. It shows that you follow me. I did get a spray tan. I don't <laughs> normally do that. And let me tell you, man. Oh, are you kidding? Me? I got black. I mean, I was like, what kind of color did you give me, man? I went, I went dark, 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 dark brown. And I was like, this does not look natural. Do you know that I'm white? 
trash. <laughs> By the way, I am not capable of throwing my voice. That was me weeks ago. <laughs> I'll take credit for that. One. Oh, God. <laughs> no, but uh, tell me. And I'll, blame. I'll, I want to talk about the one reason I had you on is because I think you should be. You've been on camera, not like most of us radio guys. You've been on camera a lot, Mike Brooks. Yep. And you're a guy that I think should be behind a microphone or in front of a camera. Um, I did what I could to help you at 106.7 to get you on. I, I spoke for you. You got me to try out. I did. I actually, and I'll tell you, I, there's not many people I do this for because most people in radio are broken or weird as hell. <laughs> or they're super nerd, and I just can't trust them. But you're a guy that I can, and I went to him. I said, this dude's solid as a damn rock. I said, I'm not saying the job's beneath him, but for what he's done in his life, a little bit, but he's got a lot to talk about. He's got a lot to say, and he's never short of words, and he's a professional. And they gave you the shot. And then the next thing you know, you got the job. They, you were no fill in. They gave you your own spot. And uh, I just want to know, you know, how you feel about the loss of 1067, you know, and, and going in, working every day, and what your plans are and kind of what's going on. No, I, I tell you what, 1067, and I, I appreciate everything Steve did because when I heard that they, uh, you know, they, they shook hand one of their nine to noon guy, and I said, well, you know what? How about a shot? Well, they had already, I think, decided who they really wanted to begin with, but they were trying these different people out. And so Greg Tatum, who was the program director at the time, he said, uh, I'll give you an hour. So after the hour, he went, wow, that was, uh, that was pretty good, you, you know, for never doing radio before. And I'd done a little bit of radio. I'd sat in on, on your old show, the regular guy's show, a couple sure. times doing the celebrity news kind of thing. I've been, uh, I, I substituted up in Minneapolis, Minnesota on KSTP. Snow AM reports. 1500. Yeah, you know, <laughs> talking about guns and Gu people like Her, and, and Today we're like talking that. about cheese, guns, and snow. And ice fishing. Stuff yeah. that matters to people. <laughs> yeah. Come on. No, but, I, it, you know, it was great. And then... And right after that, uh, you know, Shannon Burke would do, had the visitor or the um, the listeners vote on who they liked, and Shannon and I got the highest votes. And then right after that, after Shannon got the job, I they, I got a call. What are you doing next week? Would you like to come and sit in for the Kimmer? So I went. I'm Kimmer approved. That's pretty damn that's, good. That's pretty huge. <laughs> Absolutely. So then I wound up uh, being a substitute for Kimmer and Shannon and that other liberal, no good Brian, somebody. Let and, him not be known. Yeah. <laughs> And then, and then when they decided they were going to flip formats and go to all talk, I was I was privileged enough to get the uh, noon to three spot, and uh, it was fantastic. And I tell you, working with people like uh, like Brett Barney and and everybody there at one hundred six seven and and the Hangman, and I, it, it's it was it was great. And and I miss it. I'm every day I get I want to I get up. What am I going to do today? Well, let me see. Maybe I'll uh, do some laundry or... <laughs> Listen but, to Mo Bamba. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I got some things working right now. And I still also have the um, the Sunday show with uh, criminal defense attorney Dan Conaway called Arrested, which is on 4 o'clock every Sunday evening on AM 920. Um, so that is on the answer, they call it. But um, yeah, I'm doing that, and I might have a little something coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Well, you know, and I became a fan of yours, and that's where I, I think uh, we first met because you did come on the regular guys on Rock 100.5, and this was years ago. Yeah. But I saw you, you know, on CNN. Um, I loved what you were doing on court TV, and I knew you'd been on HL. On in as session, well. yeah. Yeah, the in session thing that you were doing with your buddy now on 11 Alive. Uh, well, well, Vinny's now the main, the lead anchor for Court TV because Court TV is back, and you may see me in the very near future on Court TV as well. We should. You, you and Vinny played so well off each other. Yeah. And uh, at the time, I got a kick out of you because you're kind of like I am. I, I think you're even you're, you're you're more factual than I am. I think uh, you're a natural host. I'm a color guy. And uh, for me, you were a color guy you're on a that color show. Guy? I am a color. Oh, well, that's a spray tan. No, you know that I'm white. <laughs> what? I'm avoiding this. Topic. No, no, I'm just kidding. I, I thought you said you're. you're it's like color the plague guy. just got put in front Look, of me. I'll, I'll go ahead and break away. myself. Say, okay, no, here's the deal. I'm a black man inside, white man out, and I wish I was an American Indian. There you go. Now you know. I'm South South Steve. I'm black below the waist. Come on now. How? Oh wait, yeah, come on now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but no, you, you are you're you're a host, but you are a color guy. I am a color guy, but you know I can work with somebody that just has to be the host. I don't have to be the host. I can do color. I don't mind. Exactly. I like it. It's fu it's fun for me uh, to, to get set set up. It's like a T-ball. It's like, how can you miss? 
Especially when you're as good as I am. And see, that was kind of my role with uh, with Vinny and I sure. on uh, on in session. Similar role that I have, and I respected it. Therefore, I was entertained by you. And uh, nothing against Vinny. I like nope. a good setup guy. I like a fat guy. You got to have it. I've got that in uh, Jason Bailey on fat Bailey guy? and Southside. Not fat. Sometimes they are. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, no, I, I enjoyed you. You made me laugh and everything. So I became a fan of yours, not even knowing you. And uh, then when I got a chance to meet you and then saw how you were integrated into not just the APD, but also the fire department. Right. You know, I I couldn't believe you've got so much mad respect out there on the streets and with the uh, Atlanta Fire Department. How how is it that you relate to that? Because I know all your work was in Washington. Well, see, I started off, well, back when I was a kid, when I was two years old, my dad. Joe Brooks. His name was Clarence, but his, everybody called him Joe. Because actually, when I was born, my uh, my grandmother said to my mother, "Are you gonna? Because he's a junior. Are you gonna name uh, name your new son Clarence?" My mother said, "I wouldn't name my dog Clarence." Hell. So it was Clarence J. Brooks, and everybody knew him as Joe. How so, tall was your dad? Dad was about six feet. He's okay. about six feet tall. Mom was about five seven. So, which is, which is tall for a woman back then. I was hoping you were going to say your mom was like seven foot. Yeah, that's what I was waiting on. It's like a pure Amazon. <laughs> Sasquatch. And she was a hell of an athlete. She played volleyball, basketball, that kind of thing. Even, awesome. like, even while she was pregnant with me. Anyway. Oh, well, that makes so sense. When I was two, <laughs> it makes sense. That's she why ever take a good athlete. She ever take a hit to the belly? <laughs> <laughs> One, two. <laughs> so when I was two, my dad actually became a volunteer <laughs> fireman. And I hung around the firehouse with my dad when I was a kid. And he told me what to do if the bells kicked in, go sit in that chair, he's wait there, and I'll be back, and dispatcher was there. And um, so when I was 16 years old, you know, I was around it my whole life. My mom was on, in the Lays Auxiliary, so there was a working fire. Uh, she would take the coffee wagon out and give refreshments to the, to the police and firemen there on scene. And so I kind of grew up around that. So I was, I guess I was destined to be either a policeman or a fireman, and... Um, I, I said, well, I couldn't make up my mind, so I decided to become a volunteer fireman. And then uh, I took the test for Arlington. When I became old enough, I took the test for Arlington County Fire Department and D.C. Police. D.C. Police called me first. But in the meantime, when I turned 16, I became a volunteer firefighter with Clarendon Volunteer Fire Department, Arlington, Virginia, where my dad was, uh, was a firefighter so as well. You're doing both. I liked it because you're the only fireman I know that showed up with a gun. You know, that's great. <laughs> well, you know, you never gr- see a fireman carrying a gun. Mike Brooks did. He would put out a fire with a gun. Well, you know, I, I like it. <laughs> when I moved out to Fairfax, <laughs> <at> it, yeah. <laughs> damn flames! <laughs> Woo, I shoot the flames. They're heading right for us. You know what? You know what was kind of cool though. I, I, when, when I was out in Fairfax, I was assistant fire chief out with the Burke Volunteer Fire Department in Fairfax County, Virginia, and I had a take home car, and in my in my take-home car, my SWAT car, I had my SWAT gear on one side, I had my fire department gear on the other side of the trunk, and I had two weapons inside. I was ready for anything. And in fact, one day on the way into work, a working fire came up and turned a corner. You could see the smoke in the sky. And I said, Assistant Chief 14 to Fairfax, add me the call. And uh, it was a little late for work, but it didn't matter. It was sure. all, it's all about public service. That's all yeah, it is. Sorry, guys. I'm a little late, but I was putting out a fire. <laughs> you and I worked a fire together. Up there at Clark, Atlanta. Yes, we did. That's we showed right. up both on the scene. I heard about it. I'm on my way to work, and I'm like, I'm going to detour and go ahead and get a live action here. Or was it at night? I'm trying to remember. No, it was during the day. It was during the day. Yep. And then I'm working it, you know. Right I'm, off MLK. Yeah, right off MLK. Because you were living down in the... Uh, Castleberry. Castleberry then. Yeah. I, I was literally... I lived... My uh, my loft was probably about three blocks from there. So I was cl- four blocks if you do n- New York City blocks. Yeah. So I show up and I'm there covering it, trying to get a little intel, you know, talking to people. And I look up, Brooks is there doing what he does, except he's <laughs> behind the scenes. He's over there like hooking up nozzles and stuff. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? We're both media guys. He goes, I'm a fireman too, brother. I'm doing ma- <laughs> real man work. Yeah. Just trying to help brothers out, you know? He's like, I got the hose. Jimmy, why don't you go ahead and stretch the line? Brooks has got you. <laughs> and I'm over there just going, hey, could you tell me about the fire? <laughs> the microphone. No, I was. Uh, yeah, because I hadn't seen you in a while. No. And that's, uh, and that's kind of, we reconnected. And then we uh, did. then not, not too long after that, was uh, gave you a call and said, hey, mm-hmm. what's up with that thing over there at 106.7? You know what? And I'm glad you got that gig. No, I, I am too. Thank you. Uh, again, I will enjoy you. I'm glad you're on the AM. And again, what AM number is that where people can see you on? This is on Sundays only. 
only. Yep, AM 920. But uh, you may do something else in the works. I'll uh, let be letting people know. If you follow me on Facebook, uh, you can hit me up on Facebook. On Twitter, it's at TV Detective, as well as Instagram, at TV Detective. So it's all TV Detective. It's not just Mike nope. Brooks. It's TV Detective. TV Detective. That's easy. And I'll take my glasses off again. He w- detects TV. He does. I'm going to tell you right now, if it's detectable, he'll detect it. Damn uh, right. Uh, WGST, what are you waiting on? Mike Brooks is sitting over here. Seriously. Good God. Yeah, I'm serious. Uh, uh, you know what? You could probably talk sports. 92-9 the game. What are you waiting on? <laughs> we can talk it all. We can talk it all. Absolutely. Yeah, your, your guy needs to stay in Atlanta, and your guy needs to be on the air. And uh, there's not many, you know, and I, and I say the John Wayne thing. Does that register with you, that kind of America? Am I right in saying that? It's not a Clint Eastwood thing. It's a John Wayne thing. No, right? it, it, it's, it's, all about, it's all about the red, white, and blue. It, and yeah. it's and it's all it's all about it's all about America, and uh, I mean, this whole thing with the with the Betsy Ross flag and Colin Kaepernick this week. You talk about pissing me off. I'm about oh, to say Nike has a come huge, on, man. huge campaign. They're going to unleash a shoe that has the Betsy Ross, the Betsy Ross, Good the 13 God. states in a circle stars, and he. Why puts, do they deserve air quotes? The Betsy Ross. I just felt like you okay. <laughs> I was like, that is the name for it, right? By, okay. by the yeah, way, sure. don't think Brooks and I are really happy with your shirt because you got it unbuttoned showing your Magnum PI hair chest. Yeah, come on, dog. And I got to tell oh, you can move your titties. That's nice. But I will tell you <laughs> right now. That's what happens when you go to the gym. How, because, how long have you had that? Uh, oh, dude, you can see it looks like, like yeah, I, yeah, it looks like yeah. a tattered flag. It's pit stain. And you know what? Uh, sh- That's bad men, boys. Couple disrespectful years. to the flag. Yeah. <laughs> Look, men wearing flag shirts, no. no. Now, women, whoa, whoa, whoa. Wearing, women wearing bikini Red, white, and blue with stars. That's okay. And by the way, what about bros? Look, hold on, no, hold on. I got to say this uh-huh. on, the, on the bikini. No. I don't know why it is super dirty, but it's super hot. It's like the oh, chick with God, the yes. with the piercing and the tattoo on the back. I love a good Confederate flag bikini. I don't know why the rebel flag. <laughs> I knew it. Hell yeah, I'm from white the trash. South. I'm white trash. But look, it doesn't mean I'm a racist. It just means that's sexy. That's southern. And the girl wearing that is going to get in sexual positions. The girl in the American flag bikini will not get into. Just that sounds like the voice of experience to me right there. Oh, yeah. I've dated those girls. <laughs> hey, they're in a Kid Rock video. Don't hate on me. Hey, what, no. was, what was the name of your bar down the south side? Uh, it, had a, <laughs> <laughs> it was called, well, conveniently enough, it was called Southside Steve. Oh, imagine that. But it was based on smoking the bandit with the old flag. Now, I will tell you, my father... Uh, Lewis J. Rickman, God bless, known as Rick Rickman, because people call me Rick sometimes, too. Um, he educated me, letting me know that that flag was done for racist reasons in 1956. He said, I know it looks cool. I like it. I put the Stars and Bar Georgia state flag down there just because that was what was on the front of the Trans Am with Burt Reynolds. So right. I had the Georgia side and the Texas side. And people actually got offended by it. And I was like, my God, it was in a damn movie, and it used to be our state flag. He's up there, Charles. But... <laughs> But I will tell you that he educated me to that, so I knew it was wrong. So I was raised properly, thank God. He actually tried to redesign a state flag for Georgia, and it was a powder blue with the three columns, and uh, which is kind of what we use right now in our state yeah, flag. Right. And he was pitching it to White Fowler at the time, and uh, he, he was trying to get it approved, saying, you know, this was done for the wrong reasons, and he educated me to that. So, you know, I'm just saying it's dirty and hot when a girl wears one, but I, I do know... The difference. This is this is the look you like, right? Isn't it right there? That is what I'm. No. Yeah, yeah. Here come on, here come on. That guy, uh, that guy wait, just got we, hotter. Can we explain this to people who yes. are only listening to listeners, audio? Yes, of course. <laughs> look at the different bikinis. You couldn't find a chick in there. There's your, there's hey. your girl. Right, there's your girl. Yeah. All right, now look. That is a girl that's going to have sex with you, missionary. Tyler, why was my head? There's so your close American to flag, uh, man. <laughs> Texas, oh, dude. Yeah, American in Texas. Oh God, you guys got to watch wait, the video. Wait, wait. Throw, throw the rebel flag one up there just to. Be funny. Which one? Uh, right here. The blonde. big blonde with the. Oh yeah, yeah. Goes. This one. Oh, the, hey, uh, the other yeah. one. Yeah. Oh, see, oh now, she's a little busted. I like this one a little. That's bit. That's why you got to watch this on YouTube. <laughs> yes, yeah. This, she was yeah. busted. This part is only for viewers. No. <laughs> but Brooks, you know what I'm saying? It's wrong, but it's hot. It is. Thank you. That's I hear all I'm you. Saying. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I am. Uh, God bless America. And let me tell you, there's nothing I like wearing better than the red, white, and blue. I. Uh, hey, hey, me too. <laughs> I wouldn't wear that shirt. But you know what? This whole thing. Let me. I just, Dog, one, more, one more thing. Shop on, at Pac-Song. But if you will, let, boot, him, let him rant. Let the man. No, rant. look here. We're missing stars oh, it's, right now. Oh, you are offending. Yeah. Uh, you're offending Kaepernick because you're only showing like 48 stars. If you'll button it up one more, we'll get a couple more stars out of your shirt. <laughs> 
See, and what the whole thing with Kaepernick, I'm just going to say one more thing about this and I'll be done. Sure. With him, that goes to show that he didn't give a damn about this social justice BS and police brutality. He just hates the United States, he hates the flag, and he hates the national anthem. Bottom line, that's it. Nothing to do with police brutality. Screw him. You've been screwed, Kaepernick. Oh, man. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, pit- oh, I was pissed off when I... Read that. You pissed off? No way. Get off my lawn. Yeah. Get off my <laughs> lawn. <laughs> See, and I make my little rebel fun fun joke. I did, I did air quotes again. Yeah, well, dude, calm I, down there. Let me do yeah, my hand. Watch this. I'll do. I'll grip the table. I'm just doing rebel fun. Let me fun go down stuff. the truck and get the handcuffs. We'll handcuff him to the chair. He yeah, can't I, use his hands. God no. It's like Bernie Sanders. If you can't use his hands, you can't talk. I can't talk to you. I'm just telling you, I'm joking around about the rebel thing. Steve gets <laughs> handcuffs. This table's going to go up two or three inches because I, I hear that's your thing. What? Getting cuffed up, baby. <laughs> Come on. What's that? Yeah. I've never been cuffed. Here's what you... I will tell you right now, you, listening you audience. Never, have you cuffed? No. I've never You've cuffed. You've definitely cuffed. I've, oh, no. hell yeah. yeah I do. This I guy get, definitely, I know yeah. Brooks. I'll tell you a story about that. I, I, I will just say to clear myself when we get into one of Brooks's dark-ass stories. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm not going to tell But uh, You know what? All I'll say is she's still with us. Uh, um, No, but for me... <laughs> <laughs> people. Humor. <laughs> Chills. Uh, no, I personally have never cuffed anybody or wanted to be cuffed because I can't give up that kind of control. I don't even know that I'd let my wife handcuff me, and I trust her more than anybody in the world. Well, I, I just don't think so. Yeah, what that's a, it's vulnerable. It's a- yeah, I mean, do you know bad things can happen once you get cuffed? That's when people lose penises, and I am not letting that happen to me. And also, <laughs> the whole room went silent on that. It's like, oh, God. also, if you ever use regular handcuffs on a girl's ankles. Sometimes the handcuffs what? may not open even with the handcuff key, and you may have to go to a nearby firehouse and get a pair of bolt cutters and have to <laughs> have to cut the handcuffs off her ankles with well, a bolt know. cutter. That or so I've been told. So if you're going to handcuff am- someone by their ankles, use regular leg shackles, please. Why the That's hell? a public service announcement yeah. for you, my why, friend. Why the hell would you handcuff ankles? Like you don't want them to run? No, well, that's, that's a problem. No, Maybe. no. Well, I'm with, yeah. I'm with, I gotta admit, for the first Colin Kaepernick would kneel for handcuffing ankles, <laughs> and I could get behind that. Who says that? I don't know. We're talking about America today. I'll drink my beer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, come on. Jeez. Yes, come on. Uh, he's yes, ha- come he's on. having a Moscow mule chased by Moscow uh, 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 Tropical Kelly. Kelly. <laughs> no, but you know what? Nobody watches the Yet Come On show unless you have a sense of humor. We can joke about things, we can talk about things. But here's one thing we can all agree on on all seriousness we love America. Damn right. Damn right. Uh, Damn we right. live in the greatest country in the world. Uh, this is countries where people like Brett Barney can flourish, and that's awesome. <laughs> And that says a lot. <laughs> Drink to that. <laughs> so seriously, I've asked like 10 times, can you button one button for me? Just one button. I swear. Anybody, Bro. don't you hate guys that wear polos that won't at least button one button? No, I'm Look, just... Mike Brooks has his button button. One button. One button. To leave it wide open just says, I graduated from Alabama. <laughs> He's comfy. Leave him alone. Well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I'm cool with this. I mean, you got to flex the chest hair a little bit. But then it, uh, it shows oh, too much. God. It's like the, the, the shirt looks there. That looks great right there. Yep, I have to agree. Yeah, if you're an mm-hmm. asshole. Got a fashion consultant, oh, Steve. Man. Here. Who calls anybody the a hole word? That's telling you. All, be all over a button. <laughs> My mother listens to this show. She'll joke and go, Steve, don't joke about the rebel flag. That was out of ways. But, uh, you know, <laughs> him calling you an asshole, I won't have it. Yeah, my mom did not make it through you getting the clap story. <gasps> uh, I did last week. I got, did, did you actually get the clap? Mm-hmm. Or, is it, or do you just have uh, the drip? A non, I had the drip. A non gonococcal infection. Thank you. Thank God there's a man in the room. I had I had it myself. <laughs> oh. oh, you had the iron Q tip, huh? Oh, uh, yes, no. I did. It hurts. It does. So it's a worse hey, pain. He handcuffed her ankles and he went in for seconds. No, I had Ooh. the drip too. And all that is is a yeast infection in a man's unit. That's and that's all it is. and it's from using it too much. Yeah. Thank you. That's all I can say. And when Brett yours has training Sweet wheels brags, on it, guys. I don't know. Brett, <laughs> I'm just saying that's what the doctor told me. That's what the yeah, doctor. Dude, it's not training wheels. It, my balls are just. It's that a big. strain. No, it is a strain. The doctor referred it to me. Is that it's kind of like a yeast infection. You know, it's kind of like you put in the, and she gave me. You know, I did air quotes again. She told me. She <laughs> said, uh, Dude, some that's a- "Antibiotic." <laughs> <laughs> Let's welcome on today, Mike Brooks. Brooks. Use the oh, laser, pussy. No. no, you know what it is? She told me it's like I put my stuff into a bad armpit. 
Oh. <laughs> I don't know if that's, that's better or worse. That's hmm. the way she described it to me. She said it was like a dirty armpit, not your fault. I go, thank you. Just when I thought we were going to have a comeback episode. <laughs> <laughs> so your mother quit watching over that. No, she's still rocking and rolling. All right, cool. Brad barely made it through that story. You almost bit through your finger. You're just like, Argh. oh. Brooks, God. I love looking at this list. Mine would not be this long. I love it. Uh, when you graduated at 18, by the way, thanks for throwing that in, Brett, because most guys do graduate at 18. That's not true. I graduated on June 10th and June June 25th, I started with the Metropolitan Police Department. That's incredible, dude. Yep. You went straight from high school right into a uniform. Do you think <clears throat> that it hurt you uh, not going to college? No, but I went to college at night. And uh, so I would direct traffic and write tickets all day, and then I would go to class in the evenings. And, well, uh, be <laughs> where's that, Brett? Why don't I know that Mike Brooks has a college education? I, you- I, I was 30 hours short of my degree. Oh, so, wow. You're like me. Because he doesn't have one. There you go. <laughs> Okay, go. good point. I will tell you. But I'll, you know what? I went, to this, I, went to, I went to a real school. It's called The Streets. It's called Hard Knocks. What, what, do, what would a college education do everybody? Do you think it would have made me a better cop having a college education? No. 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 You think actually, it would have made me a better television person? No. No. No, no, no. College I have more help. life experiences than most people will ever have, and, and, I, and, I'm, and I'm very fortunate for that. And I've traveled the world, working terrorism all around the globe, and, you know, I, without a college degree, still worked, didn't it? You're damn right. And I, I'm right there with you. And the one guy that has a college degree is wearing his shirt wrong. No. Oh, wait. So the two guys who don't have college degrees want to tell the guy with the college degree how to wear a T-shirt? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's all right. Go wash my car and park it for me. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> and spicy. No, I didn't mean to say that to you, Brooks. I should have oh air quoted that. God. Go on, watch this. Somebody in the room's up. I should have air quoted. Yeah. Boy, we were talking about dicks before the show. And you know what? There's another one. There's another one. There's another one. There's another one. Hey, who am I to brag? I, got, I went and got into Alabama and graduated. Like, No, Alabama's a big deal, regardless of what people think about it. Here we are. No, I mean, seriously, a lot of people. You could have never gotten into GW, but that's okay. I mean, (laughs) I don't see anybody hanging that degree on their wall in this room. Yeah, that's okay. Brett. Go back tomorrow and get it. But you know, does it do me any good? No. Yeah, 30 hours, you could go knock that out in a semester. I could do it online. Do I care to? No. (laughs) Damn right. Would it make me a better person? No. No. Would you still get in state? (laughs) Yes. No. Yeah, harmonizing on the note. <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm with Brooks. No, uh, tell me this much, because I, I, I love Dick. Look, all right, well, can we quit calling people penis? No, it's Brett, not oh, it's you. Brett. Oh, sorry. Thank you. I love you. I was just <laughs> Dick. Okay, sorry. Dick, <laughs> dude. If wait, you're wait, watching wait, this wait. one on YouTube, this wait, one's a trip. Uh, wait, wait. Dick. Notice how close it is. Dick. <laughs> oh man. Me, Dick. Brooks, God knows. Hey, why couldn't you have? Why, why can't you get the studio down to Buckhead so we have to call them all the way to Alpha? I know, damn it. I know a lot well, of just people. Just asking. I, well, I, don't tell everyone where we are. Look, Nobody knows. Nobody knows. <laughs> they can find you anyway. <laughs> Brett, you're easy to find. Look for a black Camaro. Oh, yeah, they're not going to make Camaros anymore. Did you hear that? Yeah, huh? you got the last one. Rebel <laughs> Yale. <laughs> Hi, man. Roll tide. You could Roll pull, damn tide. You pulled a Chevy steering wheel out of my dead hand. Drive a Camaro. <laughs> How you like me now? Damn got stripes on it, too. Boom. Hey, when do I get to start asking Brooks some bullshit questions to mess with him? <laughs> look, look, we'll ask Brooks questions in a second. I want to learn more about Brooks. I know some things, but I want our Can audience to understand. Movies? We will get into the movies. Stand by your man. Um, let's see here. I like the fact. When you were investigating things, uh, the U.S. Embassy bombing in Kenya, you did the Kobar Tower uh, bombing in Saudi Arabia. We just discussed that was right right now. This is the anniversary of that. Tell me about, damn it, I'm talking. (laughs) Was the TWA Flight 800? That's where I'm going. I'm going to ask him about the crash of the TW Flight 800. A lot of people believe that was a missile. Well, there were three, there's three thoughts, schools of thought. (laughs) Girls. trying to build suspense. Girls. When I went up there, they said, look, don't argue with anybody because some people think it's a missile. Thank you, sir. Some people think it's a missile. Some people think it's mechanical. Shh. Hold on. I want to hear it. And some people thought it was a bomb. Pop it. Wait. Oh, you want to hear I that? I want to hear that. I love the sound. I love the sound. I know you do. A bomb? Shh. 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 Yeah, come on. All right. There you go. Go ahead. Yes. So, but all indications and all the evidence that we were able to glean from that, 
nothing led us to think that, number one, it was a missile, and number two, it was a bomb. And gotcha. looking at putting the pieces all back together, because they were able to recover 95% of that plane. That's and unbelievable. It is. It and, really but, is. But we used, we used clam boats to rake the bottom of the ocean what, off of Long Island to make sure we got all what, the pieces. What was the depth of the actual destruction? Because the fact that it did happen over water and you recovered that much of the aircraft, how deep was it? Can I just ask, like, when did this happen and what exactly happened? Because I'm sitting here going... What the fuck are they talking about? There we go. Boom. Dropped one. Yeah. F-bomb. TW-800 happened in, uh, in, 19, in 1996. I'd just gotten back from Cobar Towers. Oh, and, seven. Yeah. And um, it, was, it had taken off from JFK and got over the water, and there, there was an explosion in the fuel tank. It was sparked by a, a, a little pump. It's, it's too long to explain. But it blew the fuel tank out, and it went straight down. It broke into a couple pieces. In fact, um, I was part of the dive operation. I was on the USS Oak Hill, and I was out there for uh, almost a month with uh, Navy divers and that kind of thing and recovering everything. And then we'd also had people that would go to all the autops- autopsies as they were um, recovering the bodies and everything else. But they actually found one flight attendant who was still strapped in her seat and she was totally intact, oh, not a scratch on her. But when the, it, it, they thought it hit the, they believed that the plane hit the water at about 400 50 miles per hour. Damn. And the G-forces God. that that plane pulled in the part of the plane where she was, where she was seated, it basically separated her aorta from her heart, and she bled to death internally. Beautiful girl. Oh, Beautiful God. flight attendant, yeah. So she was intact, but her insides were yeah. from the Gs? Yeah. Oh, wow. That is and cool. then I mean, it, it was nasty because the, the marine life cool. it really wreaked havoc on the, on the bodies and everything else. Well, but how that, long does it take? People don't realize how a body deteriorates. You know, you find out that somebody's been missing for three or four days, and they're like, we can't identify it. I mean, bodies yeah. can be un, unidentifiable that quick. And it, it depends on the conditions. You know, sure. and, and these bodies were in water, you know, like a body right now that's uh, in the woods in the middle of the summertime in the Georgia heat. Heat because you start to decompose right basically when your heart stops beating and your blood starts to settle and you start to decompose then and uh, yeah and some of the bodies were in different different states because they were found uh, different time but within 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 a couple three weeks so you recovered everyone on the flight yep recovered everyone oh that's unbelievable yeah. again how being many people over the ocean. God there were it was a it was a 747 so I Almost to over 250 people. Unbelievable. Yeah. Got in the flight. And then, you know, I would, but the last trip, I, I last investigation I did that we, I, we didn't talk about, um, it was my last trip that I took for the government. They sent me and another and, and an agent over to uh, Malta to prepare for trial. Remember the Lockerbie case? Remember, oh, yes. Remember Pan Am 103? Sure, yeah. That blew up over Lockerbie, Scotland? Mm-hmm. They sent me and, and another guy over to prepare for trial because they thought that Gaddafi was going to be handing over the two Libyans that were responsible for that, McGrahi and the other, and the other asshole. But uh, uh, we were, we, so we were in Malta for about a month re-interviewing everyone because it had been 10 years, had been 10 years from the time of the bombing happened in 1985 until when we were over there, over 10 years. And, uh, but that was my last trip was preparing for trial. And uh, it was funny because Libyan, the Libyan intelligence, there's this one guy, he would follow us all around and uh, you'd be sitting at a bar having a beer and you just go, Hey, bud, buy your beer. Buy beer, Abdul. How about you there, big boy? Want a beer? And, and he's just know, following you guys absolutely. around. Absolutely. Yeah, he, when he was with Libyan intelligence. Wow. You can put that in air quotes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah that, that, deserves, <laughs> that deserves air quotes. For this show only, I'm handling all air quotes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, uh, but that, that was, that was an unbelievable trip. In fact, when I was in Malta, was the first time I met Russell Crowe because they were actually filming, at that particular time, they were filming Gladiator. The whole uh, scene of the of the arena was all done in Malta, right. and also down the mock up of remember the uh, movie U five seventy one about Love the it. German U boat yeah. Matthew McConaughey. That's it. They were doing part of that there as well, and Bon Jovi. Yep, he was all on right, it. All right, all right, all right. <laughs> These German subs keep getting older. <laughs> Tell it, yeah. damn it, I messed it up, but I was on the right track. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Almost Bob! had it. <laughs> Almost got it. 
Give yeah. him another beer. He'll get it. He will. <laughs> <laughs> he will. That, that's a trick. There's oh, that there TWA crash. I mean, yeah. piecing that together must have been like the hardest yeah. puzzle you've ever done. Yep. Like, that's insane. And then, and, and then Cobar Towers. See if you can pull it, pull up a picture if you find one of uh, of Cobar Towers. K H O B A R. And uh, and that that was that was a that was a bad bad hit. Wait, only 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 nineteen Americans were were lost, but there would have been many more people killed had it not been for an Air Force security officer who was on top of the building when he saw the truck backing in. Uh, backing to the fence and the build, building 131 where the where it took the brunt of the damage, that was actually only feet from where the uh, and, and you, look there you go. There you that go. looks like the Oklahoma City. Yeah, horrible. Yeah, it too. does. God, That's, I remember uh, that. Yep. I do remember that. Yep. And wow. uh, yeah, so uh, he was able to sound the alarm and people were actually able to get out of there, but they figured that that bomb, the crater that 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 that, that bomb made it was they figure it was a minimum a minimum of 10,000 pounds of C4 explosives Jeez. where do you get your Ten, hands on that well, kind of stuff well here's when we left after the first gulf war when the united states left and they kind of left everything there and they blew some of the stuff up blew some of the ordnance up but some of it they didn't they believed it was you ever heard of a micklick bomb never a, a, a micklick mine what they'll what, do is is that anything like a sock bomb no not really it's basically, it's You're watching way too much Saving it's Private Ryan. No, dude. Saving Private Ryan, a sock bomb. Somebody had to bring it up. It's the only other bomb I know. It's Go. a sticky bomb. You got to use your socks. Box. The it's one that takes uh, down tanks. Yeah. Oh, it, it was called oh, the tracks. Right, it was sticky bomb. Sticky bomb. bomb. Let's Sorry. say you want to clear a minefield and you want to get your troops through there. You take this micklick and you shoot it out, and it's basically like sausage C four. And it goes out hundreds of yards, and then they crank it off, and boom. And if there's any mines there, they'll be sympathetically detonated, so then you have a clear path. Well, there was a lot of that left, and they think that they took this, some of these sausage C4s, if you will, and stuffed it into a shit truck, a truck that goes around and cleans out porta johns. Oh, my God. And that's what it septic was. Truck. That's what it was. So and they stuffed that pool in there. Exactly. How close Damn. How close was the movie The Kingdom with Jamie Foxx? Because I know you worked on that. Because right. you and I have talked about this before. How close was that to what you actually did? It, it, was, it, it was pretty close. Because the movie The Kingdom that came out in 2007 was basically a combination of three different cases, of, of a number of different cases they worked in. And then they threw in an attack on a oil workers facility back in 2003. Back before that, I had met with, uh, one day, I got a call from my, uh, my assistant director. He goes, hey, Brooksy, what do you got going uh, this afternoon? I said, I had, I had court, but it's been continued till next week. He said, well, I got some guys working on a project. He said, and they're going to meet me. They're going to be here about 1 o'clock. Can you come down to my conference room about 1 o'clock? He said, I want you, Brad Garrett, and there was some other white-collar geek agent who down there. Who, they, I don't they know the guy. <laughs> he's a total dweeb. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> you dweeb. So we show, we show up there, and who walks in? The director, Michael Mann, wow, and Al Pacino. Damn. And they were working on a project, and they hadn't given it a name yet, but they wanted to know my experiences uh, when I was in Karachi, Pakistan, back in November of 1997, investigating the um, four oil workers that had been killed, along with their Pakistani driver coming out of a hotel. They were ambushed and killed by, uh, by terrorists. And um, they had sent myself, uh, uh, two guys, and two girls over to Karachi to investigate that particular case. And so we were there with the evidence response team. And as soon as we got there, uh, Scott Jesse, who was the agent right, who assigned to Karachi, he came on, threw me a, a submachine gun, threw me an M6, M4, and, and, and Hathaway, M4. We went over to the hospital, took all the bodies, took all the pictures, and then we put them, the bodies in the caskets to send them back home. I mean, it was, you talk about nasty. That was oh. one of the nastiest things I had what, to do. What is even, you know, and to anybody listening right now or watching, what, what, what's left behind when something like that happens? Well, they were shot with AK-47s, you know, 7.62 rounds, and it just uh, uh, it tore them apart. In fact, we brought the body bags out, and we had to take, we had to document everything. Isn't that about a four-inch round? It's, it's, it's like a little bit it's, like a, like a, like a two, two, three round, but okay. a little bit, a little bit longer, It'll a little bit fatter. It'll go through a door. Oh, yeah. Easy. It'll go through Chemo. body armor. Yeah. Imagine flesh. Oof. But uh, we, Swiss we, cheese, yeah. You know, as part of the evidence response, we had to document all the evidence, and then we 
t- have to turn the bodies, and sometimes rounds would fall out of the bodies, and we oh. had to take them and put it. You know, it was really, really oh, damn. nasty. But um, so we were talking about. They wanted to know the experiences about that. They wanted to hear about moving through hostile territory in armored vehicles. You know, in an armored suburban. Uh, because they used some of that also. Come to find out what they were working on was the movie The Insider. Gotcha. And Al Pacino wound up being one of the stars of the movie The Insider. But Pacino, what a trip he was. Is he is he normal? <laughs> you know, he, he looks almost like a wax figure when he yeah. came. But we're sitting there and I was tell, talking hey, about Mike. I was talking about coming <laughs> driving driving through Karachi. And the crowds around there and actually actually having to open the door and point at M. You know, M16, everybody kind of parked the crowd. And I was talking about it. He said, whoa, hold, hold on. You're telling me you got out of that suburban and you pointed a gun at that crowd. And that crowd parted and got out of your way so you could drive on down the road. I said, yeah. He goes, whoa. Whoa! <laughs> That's a pretty good impression. Whoa! Uh, well, was actually, yeah. I'm, how have you never done this on Earth? I'm about to say, you show? nailed it. Well done on Pacino. That's pretty, good? That pretty good? damn good. Yeah. good. You're like, whoa! <laughs> Shit. Whoa! Whoa, whoa! Man, you that must was, be kidding me. That was oh. a great Pacino. Oh, sorry, Steve. <laughs> Air quote me. That was a great yeah, so Pacino. Pacino. So Michael yeah, Mann had asked me before we started the interview, he goes, do you guys mind if, if, if I, re- I tape record this? So I said, no, I don't mind. So he got all that information. And then a couple years later, I get a call from him. And it was right before I was getting to retire. And he said, hey, I'm thinking about doing a movie on your kind of a combination of the Kobar Towers bombing and, a, and the trip you took to Pakistan. And he said, you know, and, and we had those bombings over at the uh, and, and shootings of the people of 39 people killed at some different compounds in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. He said, uh, do you got somebody I can talk to about maybe doing some research and that kind of thing? I said, well, I'm getting ready to retire, but I gave him the name of somebody. And the FBI actually worked with him to make sure that everything was accurate. So I knew the movie was coming up. And then a good buddy of mine who still, uh, he runs the explosives lab for the FBI in Quantico now. He called me up because Brooks, he's an Alabama boy. Roll time. <laughs> yeah, re- no, Re- he, represent. He went to Auburn, but... No. War Eagle, uh-huh. War Eagle, War Eagle. So he goes. He called me. He, goes, he definitely he goes, buttons that button. He goes, he goes Brooksy, <laughs> you know that you know the you were the, the information you were working on Michael Mann with. I go, yeah. He goes, well, the movie's out now. He said it's going to be on TV. I said, no kidding. What's it called? He, he told me, and it, it's it's called The Kingdom. Damn. And so I watched that, and at the end of the movie, it, it scrolled the names. It said, this movie's made in the memory of those who died at Cobar Towers, June 25th, 1996, and it listed all the, all the names of everyone. And I, I you know, had personally found body parts of, some of, the, of wow. some of the people who were killed there when we were doing the search of the building. And uh, you talk about just very emotional, very emotional. Wow. But I tell you, it was, uh, it was, it was interesting to have— Three different cases that I worked and made into made into a, into a movie. Oh, that's huge! But you've also consulted on TV too, right? Yes, yeah. I was I was a consultant for uh, the show Twenty Four. Hmm. I was a, I was a consultant for season four, and I, in fact, I still had the scripts. And because uh, we go over the scripts, and then I talked to Kiefer Sutherland about uh, about how to hold a gun, and then they had to take over so an cool. air. Oh, right, yeah. that's huge. Hold on. Just Air dropping. quote time. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. You, sh- you showed Kiefer like Kiefer. Let me show you how to hold the yeah. weapon there, bro. It and took it, it took till the fourth season until he actually learned how to do it. Well, how sad is that? They were doing it. it they were doing it not the right way, but but I and Mike's also, like that's nah, not how you how you hold the weapon. <laughs> and see, yeah, no, no. they were also doing um, one of the episodes was about a uh, uh, a hostage situation at an airport, in, and they were using one of the uh, the. Uh, John Wayne Airport in Ontario, California. I've and been to that airport. And one of the old, one of the, on the far end of the airport was one hangar that they weren't using, one little piece of the terminal. And they wanted, uh, they wanted to be accurate about different bombs that they were, you know, inert material they were doing. Sure. But they wanted to make it look real. So I was consulting with them on how to make it look real and awesome. that kind of thing. So, Dude, that's huge. Yeah. That's why this guy should be working. Again, 106.7, <laughs> gone. Mm-hmm. Well, the party at uh, the end 
Yeah. It was a full blowout. Let me tell you something. There, tell me tell me about the party, because we have a picture of woo. you doing a little something-something at the party where basically you pulled a Gene Simmons. <laughs> I'm glad I own the rights to this picture. Yeah, some, I was you're the only a pervert. one smart enough no, to get one. you're a pervert. Brooks is doing his job, helping a woman out, giving oh. her the signature she wants, where she wants it, and then you're the guy snapping pickies. Yeah. You got a picture of that? He's the voyeur. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you're definitely a voyeur. That's for sure. Oh, yeah, Brooks. There you go. Brooks, tell us what's going on here. Well, that is me actually signing the breast of a woman by the name of Laura. I won't give her whole name. Yeah, I (laughs) would. Quite voluptuous. But I got to say, her husband was sitting sitting right next to her. Cheering you uh, on. Yeah. Hey, Brooks, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm not even going to kiss that breast for two weeks, and she ain't going to shower. And, and of course, it was a Sharpie. But uh, I saw her two days later, and she was able to get it off. Oh, good. Okay. Because it is permanent. And she was able to get the ink off, too. Unless you have four <laughs> four names, what did you write? <laughs> uh, what did I say? Best oh, wishes. <laughs> Thanks for coming. Uh, no, 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 I there, you keep writing until you get yeah. to the bullseye. No, I, I think I put on, as I always close my show, what do I always say? Stay safe, everybody. I think I put on there, stay safe. Stay safe, everybody. <laughs> That's it. I really, really, really want everyone to be safe. Yeah, just Absolutely. Until she gets it. Can you pull that down a little more? P.S. P.S. Pags. P.S. P.S. Yeah. Yeah. Yearbook, yeah. yeah. <laughs> P.P.S. Yeah. P.P.S. So what do you have uh, for Mike Brooks? You got some quick questions for him? Am I okay. cool to fire some? I know you and I know each other, so this is actually hard for me to come up with questions because, like, you know, I'd be producing Shannon's show, and you'd be there, and you and I no out. problem. It was just the two of us uh, in one big room. Brooksy, for an hour. Brooksy, the two of us. <laughs> Brooksy, I just want to tell you that uh, I have nothing to do with these questions. This is the one little segment that I give Brett to do whatever kind That's of. That's your t- disclaimer. Yeah, you're he damn has right. That every week, yeah. It's not <laughs> technically a segment. It's the best part of the show. All right, Brooksy. Ooh, wow. Which? Excuse me. The show. What the? All right. Show. Which? Hey, hey, hold on. Once again, our show in air quotes. Somebody's a dick. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brooks, which movie or TV show gives people the best perspective of what it's like to be a police officer? Mm. It's got to be Adam 12. Cops was pretty good. <laughs> I wrote actually trick question, it's cops, but what about like things like The Wire or Chips? The or Wire, Reno, oh, no, the, the Wire. The, the, the Wire was fantastic. Um NY, NYPD Blue. That was good. Was another one of my favorites. Right. Yeah, and uh, and also I I I've been on the set a couple times of NYPD Blue cuz a a uh, good friend of mine is one of the executive producers, or two of them, uh, and one of them was actually a retired uh, NYPD detective who I, th- I went through hostage negotiation school with down at Quantico. What do you do in hostage negotiation class? You're just like, look, man, give them back. <laughs> <laughs> as simple it, as this. <laughs> actually, you know, it, there is there is certain skill sets that they teach you and everything look, else. This isn't going to end well for and you. And me no being what. a very empathetic person to begin with, you know. <laughs> look, I was, you want to go to hell. Listen, you whack job. <laughs> help me to help you. Yeah, look, that's the look, one, yeah. How, how would you like help? a cheeseburger? So wait, what about live PD? I mean, because, like, the thing is, you don't really see the aspect. In a drama, you see the behind the scenes, the in the office, the at the desk. You don't see that stuff in cops. You just see them making the arrest, and that's it. Right. Uh, and, and that's why NYPD Blue was good, because it, it, dealt, it went into the problems. I mean, yes, there's alcoholism. There's, uh, you know well, I mean, I've been, ma- I've been married twice, and The Wire, the same thing. Yeah. The Wire was still uh, based in Baltimore. It was still probably Your one of the stomping them. grounds because well, one guy was, in Baltimore. Yeah, one guy who wrote it was a cop, I believe, and then the other was a police reporter. So like they yeah. had the complete inside. Yeah, line exactly. Sure. No, that that was a very good show. I, I would love to see them bring it back. Mm-hmm. To be honest, it's and, almost uh, impossible to keep a marriage together doing a gig like that, isn't it? Almost, it's, it's tough. It's got to be. It's tough. Can't even imagine. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, lot of late nights. Yeah. One, one, one question I have, and you can, and you can, yeah, and you can make up a lot of excuses if you yeah. want to. Yeah, screw yeah. Around. I got a call. That's look, what I, they did on the wire. Look, all just the like time. I said, look, I, you know, I, I love being married. I just wasn't very good at it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> this wasn't I'm, in my skill set. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm uh, only a man. I'm only human. I'm, Do the best. I'm weak. Come on. Uh, one one question I have based on your question, which, by the way, Brett was a damn good question. I actually wrote serious ones for him. I'm about to say Brooks deserves that kind of respect. Hill Street Blues. Excellent. Loved it. What about Chips? Probably before his time, but I loved it. Chips was entertaining. Reno 911? Garbage. 
All right, why do you even bring that up? That now you're poking at him. That's a dumbass. Oh, because I've never poked at him before. All right, go ahead. What do you got? Next question. All right, at what point is a police officer considered a cop by fellow officers? Meaning, at what point are they accepted into the brotherhood? I know this is a conversation you and I have actually had before, where there are people who always want to be a cop, and then they become a police officer. They go to college. They do whatever for it. Then they get this dream job, and then within less than a year, they're like, "Yeah, this isn't for me." But yeah. like, what at what point do you guys accept that? It, it's it's interesting. You, were, I, I just read an article about someone who joined the police department. And they decided it wasn't for them. You know, like I don't want to, want to pansy. Yeah, exactly. Um, I, but it, it, a lot of it depends where you are actually a cop, and whether you're uh, a county cop. Sometimes you know, with chasing juveniles around where there's not a lot of crime. But I'm telling you, if you're in a if you're in a major city like Atlanta, DC. Philadelphia, Boston, New York. I mean, you're you're gonna you're gonna learn the job quick, uh, and and you're gonna. I mean, it may, it, you it can age you quickly as well. Mm-hmm. And um, I mean, I'm I'm very lucky. I feel fortunate to have done 26 years with um, with minimal damage, with still a sense of humor. Um, but there comes a you know there comes a time sometimes that you you you, you earn your respect on the street. Gotcha. And, and I and I was lucky because I I was I was a cadet. And then when I turned 20, I got my gun and my badge. And I was, I mean, I was 20 years old. I couldn't buy a mixed drink. I couldn't buy ammunition for a gun. I couldn't buy a gun, but I had one. But they allowed you to do that if you were a police cadet for at least a year. They allowed you after your 20th birthday to go ahead and they would swear you in. And then I was assigned to patrol. And I wasn't in patrol very long before um, I was at the range one time. And there was a captain from the Special Operations Division. And I shot really well. And he asked me, and I was, I was a big guy then, he said, uh, he said, would you have any interest in coming to uh, the Special Operations Division? I go, hell yeah, I would. Love it. And so I spent most, the majority of my uniform career in the Special Operations Division. And that's a cooler uniform too, isn't it? Well, in 1980, we had, uh, we had the, back then, we had the hostage barricade team that handled you know, barricaded subjects. And then in 1984, they decided, because we had so many jobs, um, barricade, um, suicides, uh, you know, jumpers. They decided they wanted a full time tactical team. So we decide they decided, okay, well, we're going to form the emergency response team. But everybody had to reapply, even though you know you were already in SOD and already had a certain skill set. They made you reapply. Uh, it was a 50, 50 person team because we did have a couple women on the team. Um, it was a 50-person team, and you had to try out. It was a three-day tryout, and I was lucky enough to be one of the ones who made the cut. That's and, good. Uh, yeah, and because we had close to 250, almost 300 people apply. That's a huge thing. So, and you're a lefty. Do you shoot left? or I shoot my pistol left-handed. I shoot a rifle right-handed because I learned how to shoot a rifle. <laughs> That's called ambidextrous. I learned how to shoot a rifle when I was a kid. My dad had a twenty-two, and my next-door neighbors, the, the Nichols boys, and one there were two, two, two of them became Navy officers, one became a Marine officer. And at my local high school, God forbid it happened today, but at my local high school, the public school, where my dad actually went to junior and senior high school, they had a rifle range in the school. Crazy. And I started shooting, and it was a bolt action twenty-two, and I was shooting right left-handed in this. Mr. Ramsey, Jim Ramsey, who was the shooting coach, he goes, Mike, you might try right-handed. It might be a little bit easier for you. So I did that. My scores came up, and I've been a right-handed rifle shooter ever since. Yeah, I got it. And it makes me a better shooter because I'm ambidextrous with, uh, with you know, All pulling right. the trigger. At least you, air quotes. It, look, at least you had that going. I had an no. archery. We, we did archery. We didn't have guns. <laughs> I know it, but you know what I did to make archery intense? Oh, that's that native with a lot of women. That's that Native American thing coming out in you. Damn right! I took the arrow. I shot an arrow. I can smell the deer a mile away. Yeah, I shot an arrow. (laughs) (laughs) Hold on, I can sense it. I smell it. No, I shot an arrow straight up in the air, and you never seen so many people scatter. That was pretty stupid, but it was fun. Oh, you know what? Speaking of shooting things in the air, you know, with the Fourth of July. Coming up this week, little firework action. Come on, <laughs> the best game in town: fireworks or gunshots. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, at least in my neighborhood. Hey, if up you, here, yeah, depending where here, you live, yeah, yeah. I live in I live in Kirkwood, Kirkwood, and so uh, that's a big game. I'll sit out. I'll sit out on my on my swing with my Kevlar helmet on, with my bourbon and my cigar, and I'll and I'll and we'll play. 
Gunshots or fireworks? That's a great visual. And by the way, <laughs> I'll post a picture. I'll I won't tell you take that. a headshot. No, I'm with you. In my neighborhood, too, back in the day, now it's definitely fireworks, but back in the day, it was gunshot or fireworks. Oh, hell yeah. And I can tell you off Buford Highway, it's gunshots. Oh, yeah. Boy, certain people celebrate the different ones. <laughs> I'm like, what are you doing? Bullets come down. Sorry. Wait, so at what point is a rookie no longer a rookie in the police department? Well, t- uh, technically, after you serve your probationary period, which so is one year. So year. Year, okay. yep. But, right. but to some senior officers and detectives, you're still, you're still a rookie. Hey, rookie. Yeah, rookie. Yeah. Has, or cadet. Has there ever been a bounty on your head? No, but I was on a white supremacist hit list. Wow. Yeah, I was on a white supremacist hit list. Bragging rights. Yeah. Um, Wait, the, the six foot seven white that's guy like that's bald yeah. was on the skinhead hit list? I was on a white supremacist hit list. Uh, that's where they all go. <laughs> look, attention all my supremacists. He looks like yeah. one of uh, us. Look, look, look. He's an insider. I'm going to tell you right now, just because he looks like he doesn't mean he thinks like him. Get well, him. Actually, Nelson Mandela, after he was he got out of jail, he decided he was coming to the United States. God so, bless him. Dude. So it's he a was Mandela. He was coming that Mandela fella. I tell you right now, all that jail time, dude, you're the man. Mm. Rock star. His wife was a nut bag, but anyway. <laughs> Not his fault. No. So he came to the United States. He came to DC, of course. And at the time, there was uh, to demonstrate against the South African embassy and against Mandela. There was a 500-foot rule. You couldn't get within 500 feet of an, of an embassy and demonstrate. So at that time, there were all kinds of people demonstrating, and there was a white supremacist group, and my partner, I had just become an investigator, and I just left ERT, and I was with my partner, uh, Jimmy Bradley, and we went down to introduce ourselves to these people to make sure that they were able to practice their First Amendment right of, of free speech and demonstration. And there was a couple different groups. There was a couple skinhead groups, uh, Bash, the Baltimore area skinheads. And there was another group called the National Alliance. The National Alliance was headed up by a guy by the name of William Pierce. And William Pierce had his, uh, he wrote books under the name of Andrew McDonald. Hmm. And he wrote the book called The Turner Diaries. The okay. Turner Diaries was the blueprint that Timothy McVeigh oh, wow. used for the Oklahoma Federal Building, the Murrah Building bombing. And uh, so they were there, and we went up to talk to them. And one of them, one of them got his camera right in the face of Jim and hit his hit you know hit him in the head with the camera. Well, Jim pushed him back. They jumped on us. We beat their ass and locked up a couple people. And thank God, a buddy of mine, a guy I knew really well, I'll say. Who is a reporter for the local ABC affiliate? He and his camera and his and his uh, photojournalist were across the street and got it all on camera. Well, I got the guy. I got this one guy, Kevin Kevin Strom, and choked him out. And so they so they sued us for uh, false arrest, false imprisonment, and use of an illegal chokehold. And they actually it went to federal. It went to a jury trial. Unbelievable. Well, after after they were everything was done. The jury was out half hour. <laughs> they found in our favor, of course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't use the proper wrestling. Move so on after that, that uh, and, and during that time, I was on a on a Jim Bradley and myself were on a white supremacist hit list. That, wow. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. That's not yeah. good. Yep. Damn, dude. Yeah. All right, uh, Southside. I'm sorry, man. Just hold on for the rest of these. I'm just going <laughs> to skip the serious ones and just go right to well the point, Brooksy. Have you spent more time in your life on patrol or in a bar? Oh God, that's a tough. That's a tough. That's one. a good. Is that not a good question? For that's you? damn good. <laughs> I knew. I, I knew I would give you one. <laughs> Come on, I got to give you. That's no one's ever asked that question before. That's pretty damn good. I don't though. know anybody would even think of that question because, but I know him so well. That's At least you didn't go donut shop, so this is good. No, I mean, yeah, or how about offensive. how about. In a, <laughs> in a bar while on patrol. No. Oh, damn. Oh, I don't wait. blame him. What, wait, what happened? I am just. What is no. that considered? Oh, because that's dull. You're Drinking double- on the job? It's a business. <laughs> Basically, it's yeah. a business check. <laughs> Time out. He's double dipping. Drinking on the job. Well, see, Southside will appreciate this. Hell yeah. Well, drinking? Most Wednesday nights <laughs> in Washington, D.C., nice it was nights. ladies' nights. Yeah, come ladies on. Ladies' nights. So if I'm working 3 to 11, and I, this was back when I was a young boy. If it was 3 to 11 and I'm working, I'd, there's certain 
bars that I would stop in to see what the talent looked like. The and you walk, and <laughs> you walk in in your uniform, and I was always very squared away in my uniform. You walk in, hey, how you doing? And the bartenders know, Brooks, hey, what's up? How you doing, brother? Hey, what? And then the girls, oh, hi, officer. Hey, how you doing? And you go, and you say, mm-hmm. And we'd uh, decide which bar, after we got off at 11, change our clothes, take a shower, change clothes, and right back to that bar. And then you're there till they close up at 3 o'clock. So you show up about midnight, you go, remember me? Right. And see, by the time we got there, they had been drinking two-for-one drinks, and Hello. it was low-hanging fruit. <laughs> Did a little scouting trip. Well, I had a little there you go. Reconnaissance. <laughs> there is Recon. nothing. Yeah, if you really want to score, that's what you do. You show there up you about go. 11 o'clock, and all the dudes that have been buying the drinks, and then you come in with good game, and uh, you take them, and you there you go. the drinks. That's what you do. And you came in man in uniform, too, and then later you get to come in good casual. Job. They get to see both sides here. There yeah. you go. Big cheersy. Smart well, you're, man. Thank you. You're a D.C. guy. How many presidents have you met? Mm. And which ones? I've met uh, I've met President Carter. I've met uh, President Clinton. I've met uh, Bush 41, Herbert H. W. Bush. Come and on. I actually worked his detail when he was VP. And my favorite of – I've met Bush 43 as well. But my favorite of all time, and I got to know him very well, was President Ronald Reagan. Damn. And if you go to my Facebook page, Woo! the first time I met him, there's a picture of me shaking his hand. He was president-elect. And he was heading back out to California after he was president-elect, and it was his first time. Technically, it wasn't Air Force One because he wasn't president yet. Right. But it was you know one of the presidential planes, and we escorted him out to uh, Andrews Air Force Base, which they now call Joint Base Andrews. But we were out there, and he came up, shook hands. He's got his secret service. Uh, well, I'd like to meet all the people that are going to be protecting me for at least the next four years. And so he gets everybody there. And we That's shake right hands. there with your Al Pacino, by the way. Thank I you. like it. Keep going. So, so he, we, we met, and then uh, I was happened to be on a Sunday. I was working, and they asked me, hey, we work Sunday, and I was in the lead car for the motorcade. And he had Nancy with him this next time. And so he wanted to meet some different motormen and that kind of thing from U.S. Park Police in D.C. And we're lined up, and I'm, at, I'm running the details, so I'm the first one. And he comes up, and, he goes, and he's got New York Times, Washington Post, and L.A. Times under his arm. Excuse me. And he's introducing his wife, Nancy, to everyone, too. And he comes up to me, and he looks, and my name tag said M.J. Brooks. And he comes up, he goes, uh, Mike, right? I go... Yes, Mr. President, it's absolutely right. He goes, we've got to stop meeting like this. And he says, oh. but I, he said, I, wanted, I want you to meet my lovely wife, Nancy. Nancy, this is Mike Brooks. Uh, he was with me last time we flew back to California. Just an unbelievable guy. And actually got to go into the White House on Christmas morning Damn. at about uh, 1.30 in the morning and had drinks with the president and, and the first lady after he went up to a friend's house and exchanged gift, gifts, and he was on the way back. It was cold, but we pulled onto the south, uh, on the south grounds of the White House, the motorman and, other, and he had, uh, they had little sandwiches set up. They had a bar, and he goes, Eggnog, bourbon? Bur full bar, bourbon, uh, whatever you want. I miss and the presidential so bar. Awesome. I just want to make like, sure it was there. And so everybody, all the motormen, you know, they're all dying for a drink, and, but they're all, everybody's standing around, and, and the, president, I, the president goes, well, uh, please, you know, help yourself, help yourself. I said, well, Mr. President, you know, technically we're on duty and we're, we're not supposed to drink. He goes, you, you mean to tell me you can't have a, some holiday cheer with the President of the United States? Please help yourself. And so, oh, man, I would say the motorman, there was like locusts. There were <laughs> bottles. <laughs> you you don't have to tell me twice. <laughs> <laughs> Most of them were probably hammered anyway because I was there antifreeze. Air quotes. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody's like, Ronald, I love it when you were an actor. You're good. It's See, that's why that's why in DC, the motormen for the US Park Police and the, and the Metropolitan Police, that's why they have sidecars. Nice. Number one, when they went around to liquor stores and <laughs> collect all their bottles. And also if they've been drinking too much, you won't tip over a leak. <laughs> I would definitely want a sidecar. <laughs> All right, Brooksy, you're a big DC sports guy. I know this. Everybody who follows you on social media should know this. I want to ask you, looking at the history of D.C. sports. There you go. Okay. Yeah, Fourth of July, Washington Nationals. Uh, yeah, come on. Yeah, yeah nothing go. like sitting in, what's that, third, fourth place? All right, come on. Uh, yeah, oh, but who won brutal, last night? Who lost last night? But we're just getting there. That's what, right. the Phillies beat us. It it's is not even, it's, it's still young in the season, son. All right, well, looking at the history <laughs> of D.C. sports. Yes. Seriously. Who's the face of D.C. sports? 
Like, which <sighs> person, which athlete? Because it's a historic area. I mean, the Redskins are they're a very historic team. The Nash or the Nationals are they're kind of newer, but you have the Capitals who just a year ago won the Stanley Cup. Are you right. talking about currently or of all time? Of all time. God, that's a tough one. I right, have two answers, by the way. Right now, I have one. Right now, I would say the face of DC sports right now is is Ale- is is Alex Ovechkin. Okay, oh, but Russian but, collusion. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's when and they went to White House. Yeah, um, but we just lost Brett Conley. He was one of the commies that didn't want to go to the White House along with uh, Holtby. But that's Good right. God. Anyway, but he's gone. Let that go. Go to the president. <clears throat> but I would say right now. Because he still has a presence on radio and TV is uh, John Riggins, Riggo, Riggo, because you know the Diesel. He is he is huge, um, and Joe Gibbs. Okay, Joe Gibbs is also there all the time. He's and, yeah, he's like y'all's Ted Turner. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I love Joe Gibbs. God, I, I, I met him when he was doing McDonald's drag racing team. He no was kidding. The, yeah, he was managing that. It was probably like 95, 96. And I had lunch with him and met him and took a picture with him. And that's when he first got into racing and then later to get in, you know, to NASCAR. Yeah, I tell but you. God, he, he was a super, super nice guy. And and Joe Gibbs was was fantastic. When they won their last Super Bowl, um, was it 1991, 92? They came back, and I went out there to escort the team in for the uh, for the victory parade. And as soon as I walked into Redskin Park, the secretary there said, uh, "Hey, Bruxy, Coach wants to see him." So I went up went up to see Coach Gibbs, and I walked in, and he threw me a game ball. Damn! What? And then he goes, he goes, somebody else wants to wants to say hello. We went down to Jack Kent Cook's office, and there's a Lombardi Trophy. And so I have a picture. Holding a Lombardi Trophy with a game ball with Jack Ken Cook and Joe Gibbs. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> and uh, yeah, they were, they, awesome. they were great. So Joe Gibbs would probably be your face of DC sports. Yeah, you know, but there's there, I, there's a lot of other. Because like in Atlanta, it'd probably be Hank Aaron. Uh, yeah, for, for, as far as baseball, no, the, I mean just all sports. All sports. Well, you know who you know who is still involved in the team with the Redskins and and everybody. He's very revered. I mean, loves the guy. Is Doug Williams. Doug Williams. That's not a bad one. What no. about Theisman? You didn't hit Theisman. No, Joe's that good, too. Your? That's me. That's yours? Yeah, right. You know, I talked to Joe when we were on Radio Row uh, yeah, for the too. Super Bowl. Yeah, I did, too. And uh, got to talk to Joe. He's a pretty cool dude. Real cool dude. And in fact, you know, I, 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 Brett's heard the story. I was actually on the sideline, on the Redskins sideline, on the end of the bench with uh, former Redskins great uh, <laughs> Butts, Dave Butts, when... When LT Ooh, hit oh. him and you could hear his leg snap. You, when oh, he made the opening oh. of the blind side? Yeah. <laughs> Whew, man. That's good. That's how you know from my generation. Uh, no, that, dude, I remember I had to turn away, but then you have Woo. to watch. You're watching between your fingers, and that just was ugly. Mm. Oof. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. All right, I'm going to give you wait, one more. I, no. I so can't give can you more I, than wait, one. Wait, can I give my two? Uh, Nobody DC really gives sports. a damn. All right, I had, R, I had RG3. <laughs> no. No, and, and I had wait. I had Michael Jordan. No, he wouldn't. Oh, have he's a wizard. He shot them both down. Come on, but you know you, MJ. It, well, one of the other things, Art Monk is also uh, Art Monk is is huge. Told you nobody would give a damn about what you thought. No. Damn. <laughs> no. All right, Steve. I'm taking two more. I want to know. Damn Brooksy. it! I just said one more. What do you, these got to be quick? I know, Brooksy. Why do you hate soccer? <gasps> I don't know if you know this, but he absolutely hates soccer. That's my sport. Well, go oh, ahead. Steve, I didn't know you were such a fan. Big he time. played soccer. It's a was... Euro sport. Euro trash. You know, I actually, <laughs> I actually played. I played goal, goalie for yeah, the. Yeah, because you're Pen- lazy and you want to run for the, the Pentagon. Too. Oh, when I was playing rugby, my next door neighbor, smartass, <laughs> dumbass, I should call you. Damn he it. Was, he was uh, with the Pentagon Officers Athletic Club, and he said, hey, we're looking for a goalkeeper. Would you like to play in it? So I played in uh, three or four games. But it was, oh, God, what boring, just boring as hell. And, I've, and I'll be damned if I will say nil. That just drives, oh, one nil, two nil. Look, it's one it's nothing what, or two what, nothing. The Germans. What's, what's the thing with nil? I'll be honest with you. When you it's used pretentious to, and horseshit. No, when you used to watch soccer, <laughs> I, when I was watching soccer like in, in the 80s on television, it was always German commentators when you watched European soccer, and they always said nil. And that's where it comes from. One nil, two nil. You know. And what does nil mean? Nothing. Zero. There you go. So it's all, all right. it's pretentious. One nil. It's just like now the dude, the Spanish guy, goal! 
in een grof. Air quotes. But sorry, I didn't mean to bring you back to. I think I think it's more dweebs at the Atlanta United games with their scarves in the middle of summer. Place is getting bombed again. I will say some of those like soccer clubs are low over the top. And yeah, I'm saying dude, that, this guy. And I'm saying that soccer. as a guy. I did. Uh, I did the uh, play-by-play and the voice for the Silverbacks for seven years, and uh, I loved it. But there was that one little group that wore all the scarves and hitting the drums and everything. That's not my kind of soccer, but it is. You know, I'm not going to bring a 40 foot flag in there and wave it. It's not my thing, but it, it is kind of cool when you're there watching it. You're like, damn, that's crazy. I do have to admit, back in '94. Were you born yet? The World Cup, yeah, baby. I was five. Were you born? I, I went to the when, World Cup in Dallas. I, I was running the security for the venue at RFK okay. uh, during World Cup in 1994. That was fantastic. And also in 1996 when we had the Olympics. That was great. You know, I went to because those Because we, uh, we had the first round and then I think some semis at RFK as part of the Olympics, and that was fantastic as well. Yeah, and in the Athens, Georgia here. But you're right, uh, there were different locations for the 94 World Cup, and Dallas was one of them. I just didn't make it up your way. Yeah. What else? One quick You ready? Ready for the dumb question? I thought we already had that one. Uh, All right, Mike Brooks. If you were playing hide-and-go-seek and you were the seeker, meaning you had to go out and find the person, Mm -hmm. and the hiders were Eric Rudolph and Osama bin Laden, who do you think you would find first? In what? You're playing hide-and-go-seek. Right. You're the seeker. Yeah. The two hiders you have to find are Osama bin Laden and Eric Rudolph. Who do you think you would find first? Well, since Eric Rudolph was uh, here in the United States, you would think that we would find him first. Uh, Took a couple more years, I feel like. Yeah, because I actually looked for (laughs) Eric Robert Rudolph. Did you? Yep, up in the hills of North Carolina when I was uh, assigned to the Bureau. And, uh, yeah, we went up there. And one of my one of my good friends uh, were y'all in the wrong spot, or was he that damn good? No, he he we we knew he was up there because he left a lot of clues. And one of um, Craig, I'll just call him one of my good friends, who was actually uh, uh, a SWAT guy with us at that particular time. But before that, he was a, uh, a Navy SEAL officer assigned to SEAL Team Six, Dev Grew for damn. almost four years. Great tracker, fantastic tracker. And um, we came across some things. That we knew were his, but should have had Steve with you, he, the Native American blood. Uh, oh yeah, thank you, thank you, <laughs> seriously, thank you. Hi, yeah, yeah. He's that yeah. way. Hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. Go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt. You. I've got, I've got a picture of but, you on my left ass cheek, but that's love. Oh, <laughs> but he was getting a lot of help. Oh really? Oh yeah, he was getting <laughs> but, like Bin Laden didn't get help. I mean, well, he had but, but whole terroristic organization. Yeah, but uh, we also, I, I, I never, I don't know if I ever told you, but after the embassy bombings, we actually raided a house in um, in Nairobi, and in that house we found it was a cover for Osama bin Laden's uh, a charitable organization. <clears throat> we actually got the, his cell, his uh, sat phone coordinates. And on August 20th, you can look this up, mm-hmm. August 20th, 1998, we sent cruise missiles to a number of different countries and almost got Bin Laden. Damn. And I can also tell you Damn. that Bill Clinton wow. had a chance to get Bin Laden a couple times and uh, decided at the last minute not to do it because it might have it might have uh, killed three of his kids. Ugh. But we had a chance to get him. Oh. But um, his So kids. who would you have found first? <laughs> Rudolph or Bin Laden? I it's it's hard to say because I we were looking for we were looking for Rudolph didn't find him but he had a lot of inside help. In fact, I broke when I was at CNN. I was so at, he wasn't in the woods the entire time. No. You think he was he was staying in homes? Yes. Yeah, people Basically. made like a romantic vision that he was some survivalist, but he was like eating out of trash That's cans right. and stuff. But yeah. but, let, but let me tell you, I can t- <laughs> I, I when they did catch him. I am actually I was a national correspondent for CNN at the time. And I got a call from one of my FBI sources, and all he said was, we got him. I said, got who? He goes, who the hell you think, dumbass? And it was, it was Rudolph. Wow. And um, in Murphy, North Carolina. In fact, I was the first uh, reporter up there and to report that actually they had positively identified him and uh, hauled ass up there. And, yep, sure enough. And it's interesting because there was a church across from the jail where he was being held. And it had, you know, those little things that they put out in the lawn. Oh, the signs? Yeah. Yeah. Well, this Don't, one, gnomes? 
Yeah, this one, no, no the signs, signs. The signs in front of church with the little letters like, oh, no. like uh, God Almighty. <laughs> so Please check like, that out. Like the McRib is <laughs> back kind of thing. Oh, right. Oh, no. Well, this one, all it said was, <laughs> run, Eric, run. Uh, so nice. they were they were very anti anti government. Wow! In right. Murphy, North Carolina, at that time, and so he was getting help. And we were there's this Italian restaurant. When right a church says somebody. that, that's pretty damn bad. Yeah. And this wow. one guy who ran, runs the uh, the Italian restaurant, he said he would see. Now that he knew who it was, he saw Rudolph walk up that street a number of times over the years. Wow! So he'd Crazy. been staying with people yeah. and doing things. Yeah. You All right, last question. I'm going to ask this one to Tyler. Oh, oh I'm yikes. throwing one uh, off the wall. Hey, Tyler. We're done. Oh, Everybody God. in this room knows Mike Brooks, meaning yeah. I know Mike Brooks. Southside Steve knows Mike Brooks. You've just been introduced to Mike Brooks. Yes. Would you consider him a Yankee? <laughs> Man, you're putting me in the hot seat. This is a long-running joke between oh, me and Mike Lord. Brooks. This has been a long situation. I'm scared to answer, but... Dick. I wouldn't consider him a redneck, but I would not consider him a straight northerner Yankee. All right, well you have oh, to pick. Oh, thank you. He's either a redneck or a Yankee. Oh, I have you to pick. pick. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. I mean, you'd fit in better with that he, crowd, but boom! you can be a chameleon. I would say. No, he's neither. He's a good old boy. That's what I mean. Yeah, I that's feel like he slipped. In, <laughs> he slipped into both. He's been both today. There you go. That's some booty. <laughs> there you go. So what is he? Oh, putting me on Where the were you spot. born? I was born in Washington D.C. Boom. And Virginia's always been. He's an like American. Half Sound and half. Of it goes back and forth. My like. great grandfather served in the Confederacy. Right. Yeah. And uh, I had yeah. family on both sides. Yep. Did he wear that uh, speedo we saw earlier? I think. Uh, no. <laughs> no. Front lines with that thing. <laughs> no. He uh, fought so you could sign titties, Mike. There you go. Oh, hey, somebody. My great great grandfather. Somebody's but my great grandfather. I don't know if you knew it or not, Steve. Mm. Was a retired. From the Metropolitan Police Department, of Washington wow. D.C., he did 20 years on the D.C. Police Department in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Dude, I think that's awesome. Yeah. I love the D.C. connection with you. That's one of the another one of the reasons we had you on on this Fourth of July week on the Yet Come On Show. One thing that we do, and I'm going to give you a, a quick moment here, Mike Brooks, before we end our show. We call it the cigarette break. That's where we give you the normal time that it would take to smoke cigarettes. So we're going to go with a quickie, like somebody's like. <laughs> Uh, so you got about two minutes and 20 seconds, give or take. Uh, I just want you to plug whatever you want to plug. Tell us about Mike Brooks, where you can be reached on social media, anything you want to say. You can you can follow me on Twitter, at TV Detective. You can hit me up on Instagram, at TV Detective as well. Follow me on Facebook. You can catch me every Sunday at 4 p.m. on AM 920. The answer on The Arrested Show with criminal defense attorney Dan Conaway. And stay tuned. In about two weeks, I might have a little announcement of somewhere else you may be able to find me as well. I like but, it. Uh, yeah, but but follow me there because I'm on, I, as you know, I'm on social media quite a bit and giving my opinion about a number of different things. And a lot of people are bitching about, oh, well, you know, President Trump, he's having his, you know, salute to America thing on the 4th of July. Well, damn it, I think it's a great idea. And but I Mike, think it what about the good. tanks? They're going to crack up the parking uh, lot. Oh, screw that. The tanks. They, they had M1 the- Abrams tanks in 1991 rolling down Constitution Avenue oh. for the victory parade, and in fact, I loved it because some damn hippie came out of the crowd, you know, gray hair, ponytail, with little with little peace sign, ponytail. Try to jump onto that M1 Abrams tank, and they knocked the hell out of him, knocked him in the middle of the street. MPD came but up, knocked him up. What about shutting down airports for flyovers and fun things? So what? Good. God bless America is what God I say. God bless America. God bless America. You've been listening to the and Yet Come stay safe, show. everybody. Oh, damn it. There's his tagline. Thank you. Got to do that. Uh, I am Southside Steve. This is Brett Barney. And, of Brett course. Brett Barney. Sorry. <laughs> That was air quotes for the <laughs> listeners. One last time. This is a video-heavy uh, episode. I just want to talk Jeez. to you. I just want to talk to your mother. Are you really happy about this? And off mic, <laughs> the one and only Tyler Perry. Great job. Uh, Tyler Perry! Tyler Perry! Yeah. Tyler, Tyler right. Perry! <laughs> Tyler. I'm and Medea. I'm Medea now. Our special guest, Michael to his mom, but to us, Mike Brooks. Thank, Thank you, you, guys. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, come on, show. Make sure you subscribe. Yeah, come on.